What's going on guys? Welcome to this new episode of the Metaroy podcast. This is the show that makes learning about crypto simple and fun. I'm your host Roy and every week on this show we talk in detail about one aspect of the crypto world. Well, technically web 3.0 because that's the kind of word that everybody is using today to describe the universe in which all these new technologies live. Today's episode is about the story of Bitcoin. This is a two part episode and in this first one we'll start with how money has evolved over the years and we'll look at some early attempts at creating digital currencies. We have quite a show lined up for you so stay tuned till the end and I promise you this will be a fun journey. Also if you're new to this show do follow me on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or whichever platform you're listening to me on. In return I promise to have your back in anything and everything the world of crypto has to offer. Before we start though, just a quick disclaimer. I am not a financial advisor and none of the following content is financial advice. So please do your own due diligence before making any moves in the crypto space. Also the world of crypto moves at light speed. So what I am about to tell you is my view of the world. And I know many of you are going to listen to it in the future. and much of what i have been mentioning here might be different by the time you hear it but that's okay so in the previous episode we have explored in detail how a blockchain network works some of the internal workings of bitcoin have already been covered in the past episodes i urge you to check those out in case you missed out on some of the technical aspects of blockchain and the bitcoin network in general this episode will be a light and fun storytelling experience with not much technical details to wrap your head around anyway it's going to be a fun ride so let's dig in when i was first researching in detail about crypto when i first got into bitcoin and all that sort of stuff one of the things that i noticed quite early on was that i had to go back and think about money in general and how i understood it and how i again sort of challenged my own conceptions of it and once i got that all sorted i found that bitcoin and crypto made much more sense so that's exactly what we are going to do we'll take a plunge to understand the history of money first nothing comprehensive nothing too deep but just a look at money how it's evolved how we use it how we used to use it and how we use it now Some of the instances of what we used to pass for money may be even surprising to you. On that note, let's start with a bit of a thought experiment. Let's imagine a world without money. Let's imagine ourselves living in a small economy. Imagine something on the likes of Westeros from Game of Thrones. So essentially a society that is kind of relatively unsophisticated, doesn't have an awful lot of technology and there is sort of an existential crisis vibe going on. And I guess what that means is that everything that the people living in this village use they either have to kind of make themselves or grow themselves you can't get it home delivered so no amazon so imagine like really really primitive times going all around now in this village let's assume you own a poultry farm and your job is selling chickens and let's say i grow vegetables and perhaps i have a lot of potatoes So let's imagine you are in dire need of potatoes and I am in dire need of chicken. Obviously the easiest way would be for us to exchange potatoes for chicken. Now you would be asking how many potatoes will be worth one chicken? The situation that we find ourselves is what the economists call a coincidence of wants. I have something that you want and you have something that I want. So let's assume that we agree to exchange a kilo of potatoes for one chicken. and we both go home happy but the next time we meet you might not want potatoes anymore you might want something else let's say onions so as a potato farmer i wouldn't be able to buy a chicken from you or maybe i would need to go to somebody else and exchange potatoes for onions and then approach you for a chicken right imagine if i go to a blacksmith and i exchange potatoes for a sword you can guess what happens next as you can see this system breaks down quite fast If only there was an easier way to facilitate the transfer or exchange of goods. Hmm? So a monetary system had to be devised to literally stop people from killing each other. And a lot of people believe that this is where money comes from. That initially human societies were more of barter economies 
and everybody sort of slowly came to that realization which you just had. There is no hard evidence for this obviously, but this seems to be the most plausible and commonly acknowledged belief. Before we discuss the history of the monetary system, I want you to think of money as a technology like anything else. I think this is a really useful way to understand the history of money, if we consider it as that. And as more people get adept at working at this technology, it becomes more and more useful and more and more advanced. So let's quickly understand the role that money plays in our society. Mainly there are three kinds of roles that money is expected to play. So the first role is a medium of exchange. Now what do I mean by this? A medium of exchange is a way of buying or selling goods or settling debts. So I want to buy your chicken. I don't have anything you want in return, but I can use another means of payment. But crucially, you have to be able to use this means of payment that I give you in the same way with someone else. And the really important part is that this form of payment has to be accepted by everyone else in this economy that we are operating in. So that stops me from declaring my chickens as a medium of exchange. The second function of money, the second role of money is as a store of value. A store of value holds its value over time. And again, a chicken is kind of useless in this respect. As I'm sure you do care for your chickens, but obviously in the long term, a chicken will die. So if I use this form of money, if I use it to buy a chicken from you, you need to be confident that you will be able to buy something of equivalent value, perhaps another chicken in the future. So this idea of a store of value is why money nowadays tends to consist of non-perishable goods and inanimate objects. It needs to be something that does not degrade or rot or go off or anything like that, because that would be obviously pretty useless. Then we have the third function of money, and this is as a unit of account. Now this means that it can be used to record the value of what you own or compare the price of different items. So as it is with supply and demand, if you have got an abundance of chickens and everybody has loads of chickens and they have got options of where they can get them, the price will obviously come down. Basic economics, right? Now that we understand the role that money plays in our society, let's talk about some more early forms of money. Money has been in use in some form or the other for thousands of years. And perhaps the first form of money was what is now known as commodity money. These would be physical things that have value in themselves. A good example here would be a chicken or livestock in general. And there is lots of evidence that cattle have been used as a form of exchange because a chicken has value itself. A chicken can give you eggs, it can give you meat, it can also give you more chicken. It's kind of like an interest bearing asset in a way. From livestock, we moved gradually to other valuable items such as cowrie shells, first used as money in about 1200 BC. Although they may seem a pretty random choice, the shells had a number of advantages. They were similar in size, small and durable. Even though these shells are found in the coastal waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, the expansion of trade meant that even some of the European countries accepted cowrie shells as currency. There were many other problems with commodity money in general. For example, lack of a common measure of value, difficulty in storage of goods, inability to divide certain items for example. Hence came metalworking skills and consequently, it became possible to use metals as money. And it has been around for a long time, right? And I think there's evidence that lumps of silver were used in Cappadocia, which is sort of like a modern day Turkey from around 2200 BCE. So they weren't exactly made into coins or anything like that. But yeah, people exchanged lumps of silver that could be used as weight. From around 700 BCE, we see coins begin to emerge and they are made of silver or gold, sometimes a combination of both substances called electron, which is technically a mixture of silver and gold. But do you see that as we have become better at working with this technology that is money, we find that it can do more for us. We'll just keep circling back to this thought over here that money is a technology over this episode. 
I think the oldest mention of paper money was perhaps found in China because paper originated there. Around 800 AD, the Chinese emperor, Emperor Hensong, began issuing paper money due to a shortage of copper. This was the first instance of money decreed by the government and issued without anything physical backing it. But the Chinese again stopped using paper money at around the 1400s and this idea seems to have re-emerged in Britain about the 1600s. Banks began storing coins in their vault. They issued notes in lieu of them. It was a bit like of a promissory note, like an IOU. So if you had to, let's say, deposit your money in the bank in 17th century, let's say, let's say you had to put like 10 pounds worth of gold. They go like, thank you very much. Here's a receipt for 10 pounds of gold. That in itself isn't of much use to you, but you can then trade that with somebody else for another receipt, another piece of paper. Now you see, we are already getting towards this idea of paper money being used. But it's kind of being backed by something kept in a bank somewhere. And these receipts became a kind of currency in themselves. And that is where banknotes sort of evolved from this idea of banks issuing receipts. So again, we see that this idea of money as a technology, the emergence of paper money is kind of another technological leap forward. It enabled larger sums of money to be traded and money to be more easily transported because it's much more easier to take a load of paper than some coins or metal money and then go across the seas. But unsurprisingly, currency came with a lot of problems, one of which concerns fiat money and this is something we'll explain in the later stages. But for now, let's understand that this is currency that is issued on the decree of a sovereign government. And unlike gold and silver coins, it has no intrinsic value of its own. Countries can thus issue such money at will, and some did and still do, potentially making the currency worthless. Another of the problems with fiat money was caused by fractional reserve banking. The story goes like this, there was this bank in Sweden which had all this gold and silver in its vault, and it was issuing these receipts. But it went too far and issued more receipts than it had reserves for. And this is what we now know as fractional reserve banking. Now this isn't a problem so long as you don't have a bank run, which is basically like everybody trying and coming back to the bank at the same time to redeem their notes for gold or silver. Because this is the thing that bank notes, these receipts could technically be exchanged for. But if you started following fractional reserve banking, if you issued more than you had reserves for, that would work for only as long as everyone or as long as too many people didn't come and try to redeem those banknotes. And this is what happened with Stockholm's Banco. There was a bank run. Too many people decided for whatever reason that they wanted to redeem their notes for the metal from the reserves. And the bank collapsed. This became such a problem that in 1821 the UK, then the leader in international finance, introduced the gold standard. In this monetary system, the standard unit of currency is typically kept at the value of a fixed quantity of gold. This increases confidence in international trade by preventing governments from excessively issuing currency. And after this, centralized banking became the norm to take control of keeping a check on this. Basically, a gold standard meant that a nation's currency is valued according to a fixed amount of gold. In practice, that means that a nation on the gold standard should have all of its currency in circulation backed by actual gold in its vaults. Is that the case today though? Not at all. And this is when people say, oh, Bitcoin is not backed by anything. It's like, well, neither is fiat money. However, the gold standard had its drawbacks. Notably, it limited a country's ability to isolate its economy from depression or inflation in the rest of the world. So the years after World War I saw economic catastrophes across the world. Germany was crippled by hyperinflation. Then we had the Great Depression in 1929 which like devastated world economies. There was mass unemployment, stagnating wages. Basically everything was going down the toilet. In 1931, the gold standard in England was suspended. Then in 1934, the US government made it illegal for Americans to own gold. They had to sell it back to the state at the rate of just $20 an ounce. 
and then the dollar was revalued to $35 an ounce, raising the amount of paper money it took to buy one ounce of gold to help improve its economy. As other nations could convert their existing gold holdings into more US dollars, a dramatic devaluation of the dollar instantly took place. This higher price for gold increased the conversion of gold into US dollars, effectively allowing the US to corner the gold market. Gold production soared so that in 1939 there was enough in the world to replace all of global currency in circulation. So the money raised by devaluing the dollar actually helped lift America out of the depression. And this idea of money was kind of being freed up. And a lot of Americans got pretty upset about it. Obviously, those who were holding a lot of gold. But in retrospect, it seems to have worked that dropping the gold standard was in fact the right call. As World War II was coming to an end, the leading Western powers met to develop the Bretton Woods Agreement, which would be the framework for all the global currency markets until 1971. Within the Bretton Woods system, all national currencies were valued in relation to the US dollar, which became the dominant reserve currency. The dollar was in turn convertible to gold at the fixed rate of $35 per ounce. The global financial system continued to operate upon a gold standard, but in a more indirect manner. At the end of World War II, the US had 75% of the world's monetary gold and the dollar was the only currency still backed directly by gold. However, as the world rebuilt itself after World War II, the US saw its gold reserves steadily drop as money flowed to war-torn nations, for example, the war in Vietnam, and its own high demand for imports. The high inflationary environment of the late 1960s sucked out the last bit of air from the gold standard. Finally, in August 1971, Nixon severed the direct convertibility of US dollars into gold. With this decision, the international currency market, which had become increasingly reliant on the dollar since the enactment of the Bretton Woods Agreement, lost its formal connection to gold. The US dollar and by extension the global financial system it effectively sustained entered the era of fiat money. Now we have used this term fiat a few times. It especially always comes up when we are talking about crypto. So let's quickly just go over in detail of what fiat money actually is. Without currencies pegged to any other asset, countries across the world now had complete control over their money supplies. How much money they produced, what it was worth etc. And this is fiat money. Money that is valuable just because the government says so. Fiat money is essentially money by decree. So in English, this has come to mean a decree or order, especially by those who have the authority to enforce it. Fiat money does not have to be backed by gold or any other assets. Just power. And usually, power means having more guns. So as you see, it all circles back to the sword. Some people talk about the idea of state having a monopoly on violence. And I guess it means that when push comes to shove, the state can point a sword at you and go like, you are going to accept this money, you are going to like it, because we have got lots more of these swords. Fiat money meant that the governments had monopoly on violence and were free to produce as much of fiat money as they wanted. And after 1971, there were periods when fiat money was allowed for growth and prosperity again. The lack of any gold standard meant that the supply of money basically grew unchecked. Banks were effectively able to create new money by issuing debt. An important moment is the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act in 1999. When Bill Clinton's administration merged investment and commercial banks together. And this meant that banks were able to take the money from savings bank and gamble with it. And this eventually snowballed to the crash of 2008, where banks had created so many complicated derivative products and debt instruments that the whole system basically imploded. The crash of 2008 obviously was kind of the low point of fiat money. And this is what brought us to the invention of Bitcoin. 
as you see this is how the idea of money as a technology evolved over time it's a technology that allowed other technology to be driven it greased the wheels imagine if you are still trading with shells or cows or just even lumps of metal we would still be in a very primitive state the great leaps forward the innovations the expeditions the discoveries all this sort of stuff it wouldn't have been possible without money being created behind it and yes this technology has done wonderful things as it has evolved it has let us do more and the ability to create new money has made us richer but obviously as we have seen it comes with its own set of dangers and the unchecked creation of new money obviously is driving fears of inflation but i guess what we can take away from this is that cryptocurrency is basically the latest technological innovation of money it is the latest stage it's like the iphone of money it's evolved to combat some of the problems with the modern monetary system now it's finally time to talk about the big daddy the og crypto bitcoin for those people who didn't maybe catch any of the episodes on blockchain or are still getting up to speed let's quickly remind ourselves exactly what bitcoin is so bitcoin is a form of digital cash and it can be exchanged between individuals without the need for any sort of third party it's completely peer to peer so previously digital assets could only be exchanged if there was some sort of third party some sort of middleman because there was no other way otherwise to prevent them from being copied and we touched upon the double spend problem as well in the previous episode which basically means that any digital asset can be very easily copied and sent to multiple recipients so that obviously has no decent use as a currency as a form of money if it can be easily replicated the genius of bitcoin was to find a way to exchange digital assets so that you could be confident that they were unique and the way it did was to use the magic of blockchain technology which obviously we have discussed in the previous episode so yeah to summarize bitcoin is a form of digital cash and electronic money that can be exchanged privately pseudonymously but not anonymously that is basically with a degree of privacy but bitcoin surely wasn't the first attempt at creating digital money ideas for digital money have been kicking around for quite some time So before we talk about Bitcoin in detail let's first talk about Digicash Digicash was an early forerunner of Bitcoin let's first remind ourselves of the difference between a cash and a digital transaction obviously cash takes place peer to peer it needs to be in person but a digital transaction can be done over distance you don't need to be in the same room but obviously it needs a middleman a third party to ensure that the accounts are debited and credited correctly usually in this case it is done by a bank so let's take a stroll back to the 1980s the computer revolution is just getting started banks are starting to computerize the whole world is starting to go digital but there was this group of people who began to realize that having banks in the middle of digital transactions basically represented a pretty big potential threat to user privacy because not only they were going to see how much money we were spending but also where we were spending it and obviously that has major repercussions for privacy because i read somewhere recently that nothing reveals so much about you as how you spend your money so one particular person who is most concerned about this state of affairs was a guy called david shaw a computer scientist and cryptographer from california who started working on digicash Shom developed a so-called blinding formula to be used to encrypt information passed between individuals. Digicash essentially used public key cryptography to develop a form of digital money that could be transacted much more privately than was possible under the regular system. So users of Digicash did not have to hand over any personal information while transacting. Quite similar to Bitcoin. However, As we have seen from the episode on blockchain, centralization is never good. Even though users were able to transact more privately, the Digicash company itself was still needed to confirm transactions and balances. Another project founded in nineteen ninety six called E Gold attempted a similar thing. It offered individuals online credit in exchange for physical gold and other precious metals. 
The company, however, ran into various types of scams and was eventually shut down by the federal government in 2005. But remember how I mentioned how David Schaum had become worried about the erosion of privacy in the digital age? There were others working on this problem too. And they have since come to be known as the cypherpunks. So the cypherpunks emerged in the earliest days of the internet. They basically were a group of libertarian-leaning computer programmers, cryptographers, scientists, thinkers, and others who were mainly obsessed with the idea of privacy in the digital age. They had amazing foresight. They saw the computer age dawn. They saw the coming of the internet. And they realized pretty quickly that although it was potentially an amazing thing, They were increasingly concerned about how the internet and digitization in general could be used by governments in particular to infringe upon personal privacy. You have got to have a real understanding of how the world works to even visualize something like this in the future. Especially when they did it, which was in the earliest days of the internet. And they believed that cryptography was the tool that they could use they and others could use to protect themselves from outside interference. Kind of a rage against the machine. They had a secure and anonymous email list which they could communicate and use, like to share ideas. They weren't solely focused on creating digital money, but it was privacy in general. Anonymous mails, forwarding system, digital signatures, you get the idea, right? There was a lot more to it than just creating a system of money that we could interact with anonymously. But that said, it was a core concern of theirs. So privacy and pushing back against the power of the state were just as important to their identity. One of the first guys who was a cypherpunk was a British computer scientist and cryptographer named Adam Back. And he came up with a system called Hashcash. Now it was originally designed to combat spam email. And he made use of the proof-of-work system that we discussed when we were talking about blockchain in the previous episode. Just to recap, it was the idea of using cryptographic hash functions to create problems, basically for a computer to solve. And as we saw, the only way for the computer to do this is to submit a lot of guesses and thus use up a lot of power. So under the system that Adam Back came up with, a computer was rewarded with hash cash when it solved this problem when it made the correct guess. The problem with Hashcash, the main problem was that all the units of Hashcash were more like digital stamps. They could only be used once. So if you were using the Hashcash system, you needed to keep creating new units of Hashcash. And obviously this isn't very useful when you're trying to make a form of money. Now there was another member of the cypherpunks, Hal Finney. And he had the idea of being able to reuse this proof of work guesses which would then theoretically give them value as a currency because of the work that had been done to produce them. And remember this name because Hal Fiddy is a big contributor to Bitcoin and we are going to see more of him in the future. And as I mentioned earlier, there were many other people working on improving digital currencies. For example, in 1998, developer VDI proposed an anonymous distributed electronic cash system called B-Money. And then there was another guy called Nick Zabo. He came up with a system called Bitgold. Now this was 2005 and this is very similar to Bitcoin. But Vidai's B-Money and Nick Zabo's Bitgold, they were only ever kind of written down. No one actually built them, but they had all similarities with each other and with Bitcoin. Well, here's a fun fact for you. Many people actually think that Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor of Bitcoin, might be a pseudonym for Nick Zabwo himself. Food for thought, huh? Anyway, coming back. All these systems, Hashcash, B-Money, Bitgold, etc. were all forerunners of Bitcoin. And all of these guys that I've mentioned, they're key players in the Bitcoin story. And we'll talk more about them at different points in the story. The systems they designed were all attempts to create a form of digital money. But they all had flaws. They all came up short for one reason or another. The biggest problem was that no one seemed to be able to figure out how to make a system work without a central authority overseeing things. And that is something we'll explore in the next episode. 
that is all for today folks in the next episode we are going to deep dive into the story of bitcoin we'll get on this roller coaster journey that is bitcoin explore some of the interesting anecdotes on how bitcoin came into being how it got some of its bad reputation and we'll learn about some of the newest milestones around bitcoin i really really hope you enjoyed this first part of this two part episode about the story of bitcoin i would love to hear your thoughts on this episode drop me a comment on my website themetaroy.com or reach out to me on twitter or instagram at themetaroy do stay in touch for the next episodes are going to be even more interesting so please follow this podcast on apple podcast spotify or wherever you like listening to your podcasts on hope you have a great rest of the week ahead and see you next monday